Saved by the Boats, The Heroic Sea Evacuation of September 11th by Julie Gassman, illustrated by Steve Morse. An arc of sky framed the city in brilliant blue. The bright golden sun beamed with warmth. Just below, gray smoke swelled and snaked through the air, and silently, white ash fell in thick snowfall, coating the city. Tragedy was quickly smothering New York City, and its people were searching for a way out. They found their way to the city's edge, held back by the water. While more than one million people searched for escape, Hundreds of boat captains sailed into the destruction. They felt the call to action, a desire to help, a realization that they could provide a safe harbor. They were ordinary people who became heroes on a day when greatness was desperately needed, a day when the unthinkable had happened. September 11, 2001 started like any normal Tuesday in New York City. Just after dawn, captains and boat crews readied their boats in surrounding ports. The ferry boat crews carried the usual commuters to work in Manhattan. Other commuters drove, rode trains, and bumped along in buses. The city buzzed with activity. Subway riders climbed up the stairs of underground train stations to be greeted by warm sunshine and a cloudless blue sky. But the beautiful day was soon broken. At 8.46 a.m., an airplane hit one of the city's most recognizable buildings, the World Trade Center's North Tower. At first, it seemed as if it were a terrible accident. But when a second airplane hit the South Tower at 9.03 a.m., the message was clear. New York City and the United States was under attack. That cloudless sky was now streaked with gray and black smoke. People desperately tried to flee the scene. Firefighters and police officers rushed to the towers to begin rescue efforts. New Yorkers from all five boroughs scanned the skies from windows and sidewalks, and boat crews watched the fires rage out of the towers. But no one expected what came next. No one expected the towers to fall. Suddenly, more than one million people were searching for safety, and subways, bridges, and tunnels were closed as a measure of security. There was only one way off the island, the water. Fleeing, hundreds of thousands of people ran until they came to the place where the island meets the water. Climbing over railings, they began boarding boats docked in the harbor. People were just diving onto the boat, said firefighter Tom Sullivan, who was aboard a fireboat. We were trying to catch them, trying to help them on. Mothers and nannies with infants in their arms were dropping the children down to us, and then we helped the mothers and nannies down. Few people stopped to ask where the boats were going. These people wanted out of Manhattan any way they could, said Captain James Paris. Coast Guard officials noticed the lines of people growing deeper. Between 11 o'clock and 11.30 a.m., they put out the all call. All available boats, rang the marine radios in the harbor surrounding area. This is the United States Coast Guard aboard the pilot boat New York. Anyone wanting to help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan, report to Governor's Island. Boats of all sizes sped to the harbor. Tugboats, ferry boats, private boats, and party boats. If it floated and it could get there, it got there, said engineer Robin Jones. And each vessel carried a captain and crew who were ready to serve. The scene the brave men and women sailed into was grim. The Twin Towers, the tallest buildings in New York City, had stood 110 stories tall. They were replaced with smoke and rubble. The smoke and dust in the air made visibility difficult. Crews knew that Boats out on the open water could be easy targets, but the captains didn't turn around. Instead, they sailed on. That day, my biggest concern was the safety of the passengers, the vessel, and my crew, and making the right decisions at the right time, explained Captain Paris. When the captains and crew 
reached the slips, they saw how badly they were needed. Many of the people looking for rescue had come from ground zero, where the towers once stood. Covered with ash and soot, they carried the weight of the day's tragedy right on their bodies. The crewmates gave towels to the victims, many of whom were crying and shaking with shock. As one captain later said, We thought if we could wash some of the soot off their faces, off their hands, we could make them more comfortable. We wanted to make them feel that somebody cared about what they had just gone through. With loaded boats, captains made their way across the Hudson River. Many of the vessels sailed to New Jersey City, Jersey City, New Jersey. There, ambulances with flashing lights waited for injured patients. The captains knew, too, that people were displaced from their lower Manhattan homes might find places to stay in Jersey City. Not only did they want to remove people from New York City, they also wanted to help people reach safe destinations. Meanwhile, back in Manhattan, hours were passing. All along the edge of the Hudson River, lines formed for ferries. Commuters had to walk miles to reach the end of a line. Police officers warned the wait could be four, five, six hours long. But what choice did the people have but to wait? The police and all who were waiting hoped the crowds would remain calm. One woman said, When we arrived at the pier, thousands of people were waiting in line. Thousands! Yet you could hear a pin drop. That was the scariest part about it. New York City, the city that never sleeps, had become almost eerily calm and quiet. As time passed, the quiet calm was disturbed by roaring fire jets. One boat crewmate recalled, The scariest part was when the fighter jets were flying over Manhattan. We didn't know whose they were, and they were coming close to us. Those waiting in line for evacu evacuation worried too. More than one person asked, Those are ours, right? Those are American planes. And they were. U.S. military jets were the only planes being allowed to fly in the country's airspace. The lines moved faster than predicted, no doubt helped by the hundreds of boats that answered the Coast Guard's call for help. After just a couple of hours, passengers boarded boats headed for safety. Many boats announced destinations on bed sheets spray-painted with words like Weehawken or Hoboken, small cities across the river. From the ferries, rescued passengers started moving away from the terror of that day. Now they could see the sparkling New Jersey shoreline ahead of them. They were on their way home, or at least out of harm's way. They had been saved by the boats. All day long, the boats sailed back and forth, rescuing passengers and then carrying rescue workers, water, and other supplies on their return. Hundreds of captains and crewmates became heroes that day. Over the course of just nine hours, nearly 500,000 people were evacuated by water. It was the greatest thing I ever did in my life, said Captain Rick Thornton. Engineer Herb Jones described it as the greatest day that I've ever seen in all my life on the water. It was the largest sea evacuation in history. It was an answer to a call for help. It was a light on the city's darkest day.